Fantastic, the weekly web show for the avid comic book reader and those who aspire to become so. This week, my new limited series from Boom Studio, Superbia, wraps up before relaunching as an ongoing in the fall. So first off, huge thanks to everyone who's been picking up the book and talking about it online because that's what's responsible for Superbia being upgraded to an ongoing. Second of all, the end of this first arc will be the end of one character's life. Now, I've done a top 10 list for every issue of Superbia so far, so for issue number four, here's my list of top 10 comic book deaths. Ha! Huh, what does death matter in a world full of resurrections, rebirths, and reboots? Often, not a hell of a lot, but on occasion, we comic book readers have been moved to tears. And obviously, this episode is full of spoilers, so you've been warned. Number 10 on my list are the citizens of Stamford, Connecticut. Actually, you might be surprised at the number of regular people on this list, as it turns out loving a superhero can be hazardous for your health. But the folks of Stamford hadn't personally flirted with danger, nor were they even targeted. Instead, they just happened to be the place the new warriors were filming their reality TV show when things went horribly wrong. Seen an attempt to boost ratings, the new warriors were hunting down some D-list villains. But it turns out the new warriors were some D-list heroes, as they were unable to cope with Nitro, who blew himself up right in the middle of a school. 60 children died instantly while the explosion claimed 600 lives in total. This not only senseless but careless loss of life led to the Superhuman Registration Act, which sparked one of Marvel's best crossovers ever, Civil War. But in a story full of grays, there was no denying that this instigating tragedy was in stark black and white. Number 9 is Agent 355 from Why the Last Man. Brian K. Vaughn's saga of a world without men unfolded from 2002 to 2008, giving readers six long years to get to know Agent 355. A secret agent sporting the real-life codename given to female spies during the American Revolution, Agent 355 was tasked with protecting the only man on Earth to escape a mysterious plague, York Brown. Now, one of the reasons death is so fleeting in comic books is because titles last for decades. Characters often need to come back to refresh or energize audience interest. But one of the great things about Why the Last Man is that it ends, and therefore Vaughn is able to tell a fully fleshed out story that has direction and purpose. As a result, York and Agent 355 are two of the most realistic portrayals of people in comics, and their love story is just as honest. Add to that the fact it's a rarity to see African-American characters, much less female ones, play such prominent roles in the medium. So when Agent 355 tragically died, so close to both the end of the story and salvation, at the one moment she finally let her guard down, we were just as shocked as she was. Number eight on my list is Superman. Now obviously this is one of those comic book deaths that didn't take. Of course it didn't. But Superman's death makes my list because of the impact it had on comics. See, back in the early 90s, comic book characters didn't die every other month, and it was hardly ever a major character, certainly not one of DC's famous Trinity. And DC did this one right. There was a huge buildup, and the story unfolded in the fall of 1992, with the aftermath lasting through much of 1993. Even though I was a small kid, I remember my dad taking me down to a comic book store at the South Street Seaport that doesn't exist anymore to buy the issue, as he felt it was such an important event. And my dad wasn't even reading comic books at the time. This story arc also introduced two new characters who would go on to become reader favorites, Steel and Connell, the clone who would ultimately become Connor Kent. Now, the death of Superman happened right before Nightfall, where Bane breaks Batman's back, and some accused DC of creating mere publicity stunts. But what's wrong with that? Both got tons of attention for comic books in the mainstream, brought in new readers, were defining moments for the characters, and most importantly, were good stories. Number seven is actually a tie, Alexandra DeWitt and Sue Dibney. I've paired these two women together because their deaths made them the poster girls for the mistreatment of women in comics. Alexandra DeWitt was dating Green Lantern Kyle Rayner when the villain Major Force, in an effort to hurt Rayner, strangles Alex and stuffs her in the refrigerator for him to find. This brutal death led Gail Simone, a comic book journalist at the time before her writing days, to coin the term women in refrigerators, alluding to how wives and girlfriends in comics are ignored by writers, except for when they're violently killed off to further the male hero's story. Now, Alexandra DeWitt was killed off in the 1990s. Did the outrage over her death change things? Unfortunately not. Fast forward a decade where the elongated man's wife met just as gruesome a fate. In the major DC event identity crisis, Sue's body was discovered burned to a crisp. As the Justice League investigated her death, it was discovered that years ago she had been raped by the villain Dr. Light. Was Dr. Light the murderer? No, it turned out to be the Adams' estranged wife, Jean Loring, who, in an attempt to make her husband care about her again, was threatening the loved ones of other superheroes to create a panic. Using her husband's powers to try and scare Sue, she'd accidentally killed her. 
wives and girlfriends, now not just on the receiving end of horrific torture and violence, but now also doling it out, their actions and fate still revolving around the male heroes. Has it gotten any better still? This situation is part of why I created Superbia, a story where the wives, girlfriends, husbands, and children are the main characters, and the male and female heroes revolve around them. <laughs> Number six is Jason Todd, perhaps the only comic book death demanded by readers. See, way before American Idol, DC Comics had the idea to let readers vote on whether or not Jason Todd would die at the end of Batman and Death in the Family. By a very slim margin, readers decided that the second Robin should die, and die he did, horribly beaten within an inch of his life with a crowbar by the Joker, and then left in a warehouse with his biological mother where they were blown up by a bomb. Now at first, everyone hated the idea, and the rumor is that a single person had managed to program his computer to call in and sway the voting process. Turns out DC had not given readers what they wanted, just one reader. But nevertheless, Jason Todd's death has become a vital part of the Batman mythology. Not only did it add realism to the Batman universe and further underscore just how dangerous the Joker truly is, but Jason's death became another cross for Batman to bear along with the death of his parents. His uniform displayed in the Batcave is one of the most recognized visual icons in comics. And 20 years later, Jason was resurrected, literally in a Lazarus pit thanks to Talia al Ghul. Returning to Gotham, Jason has become a dark reflection of Batman, a vigilante who knows all of Batman's tricks, but is also willing to kill. And poetically, Jason has assumed the identity of the Red Hood, the villainous mask once worn so foolishly by the men who would become the Joker and Jason's murderer. So while readers back in the 1980s might have actually wanted Jason to live, would any reader today vote to honor their wishes? My vote would be no. How about you? Number five is The Comedian. His death at the beginning of Watchmen was the first domino in a chain reaction that not only changed how his fellow superheroes saw themselves, but how readers saw superheroes. At the time, The Comedian was more like a character audiences would find in a movie like Apocalypse Now or Platoon, rather than the pages of a mainstream comic book. But Alan Moore set out to push the edge of the envelope, and he succeeded wildly, painting not a black and white portrait of a rapist and murderer, but a very gray one. To this day, Watchmen remains one of, if not the, most celebrated comic books of all time, and was made into a major motion picture with Jeffrey Dean Morgan playing the comedian. What's more, it's become an ethical battleground in the industry, as professionals and readers alike debate whether or not DC stole the rights for Watchmen from Moore and artist Dave Gibbons. And it all started with an aging superhero having a drink, sadly remembering the good old days before he was thrown from his window to his death. And only one man cared, Rorschach. Thus is the beginning of Watchmen. Number four is Barry Allen. The Silver Age version of The Flash and only the second man to tap into the Speed Force, Allen carried the mantle for almost 30 years before he died in Crisis on Infinite Earths, one of the most tragic and unique deaths in comics. At that point, Allen had gone to live in the 30th century with his wife Iris, who had been resurrected there after being killed by Professor Zoom. But it turns out that the Flash was the only one capable of stopping the Anti-Monitor from destroying the Earth in the current century, so the villain brought Allen back as his prisoner. But Allen, ever the hero, managed to escape and stop the Anti-Monitor and save Earth at the cost of his own life. And that's what made Allen's death so tragic and yet also so heroic. Not only did no one know that he'd saved Earth, but no one even knew that he died. How often does that happen in comics? Yet real heroes often die alone, unnoticed by those they have saved. After Alan's death, Wally West became the new Flash that most readers are familiar with today, the version who appears in Superman the Animated Series, Justice League Unlimited, and currently Young Justice, and became quite popular. But one person in particular did know of Barry's sacrifice and remembered it. Writer and DC heavyweight Jeff Johns orchestrated the return of his childhood hero in 2009 with The Flash Rebirth, restoring his position as the DC Universe's The Flash. What happened to Wally? Well, in the New 52, Wally doesn't even exist. Yet. Number three is Thomas and Martha Wayne, whose death has created and haunted one of the most popular comic book characters of all time. While Jor-El and Lara knowingly sacrificed themselves so that their son might live, the Waynes were victims of senseless violence, stolen from their son. After taking him to a showing of the Mark of Zorro, the Waynes decided to walk home, not a smart choice in seedy Gotham. But while the Waynes might have been part of the 1%, they were philanthropists who chose to assume the best of people, which was their undoing. In a robbery attempt, two-bit criminal Joe Chill panicked and shot them and then ran, leaving Bruce Wayne to helplessly watch his parents die alone on Park Row, a street which would be dubbed Crime Alley in the wake of the Wayne murders. Those murders shocked all of Gotham and led Bruce to a fateful decision, not to avenge their deaths by simply striking out at Joe Chill, but to fight all of Gotham's criminals so that nobody would suffer as he had. 
But even beyond his crusade, the loss of his parents devastated Bruce to such a degree that he never truly let anyone else into his life. That is, until recently with the discovery that he has a son with Talia al Ghul, Damien. Will having a family change Bruce, or will he once again have it stolen from him? After all, Robins have a history of dying. <laughs> Number two is Jean Grey, a death which has shown tremendous self-control on the part of Marvel. Not only did they kill one of the original X-Men, who was a major character for decades, but they have kept her dead for what's now almost a decade. And they'd be perfectly within their rights to bring her back, as that's what Jean does. She dies and comes back, thus her Phoenix moniker. But as Grant Morrison accurately realized, Jean Grey had run her course as a character. So instead of shunting her to the sidelines, or even worse, allowing her to become a nuisance to readers, he killed her for the final time. And her shadow still hangs over the Marvel Universe. Wolverine has named his new school after her, and she haunts the summer's mega-crossover event, Avengers vs. X-Men. So why didn't I make her number one on this list? Well, it's because her death didn't really mean anything. In typical Morrison style, his story logic at the time of her death had somewhat gone off the rails in a flurry of creativity, making the event almost like a brain fart. So Jean's death itself wasn't important, but her absence from the Marvel Universe is, freeing Cyclops and Wolverine from a love triangle that had become cumbersome to all three. In the end, Jean had become too perfect, almost a living angel, so Morrison took her all the way. Sure, she might come back someday, but as we can see from Jason Todd and Barry Allen, it's the decades-long deaths that serve the characters and readers best. And number one is another tie between Uncle Ben and Gwen Stacy. Like Bruce Wayne, the deaths of his uncle and girlfriend have haunted Spider-Man and made him into the superhero he is today. So why are Uncle Ben and Gwen Stacy's deaths more important than the Waynes? Well, while Jor-El and Laura knowingly sacrificed themselves and Thomas and Martha Wayne were the victims of senseless violence, Uncle Ben and Gwen Stacy died because of Spider-Man. When Peter Parker first got his powers, he used them for personal gain, competing in wrestling matches. One day when coming home, Peter crossed paths with a burglar being chased by the police. Peter had a chance to stop him, but didn't, claiming it wasn't his problem. But it was the same burglar who later just happened to rob the Parker home and murder Uncle Ben. It was then that Uncle Ben's earlier words of advice came back to haunt Peter, with great power comes great responsibility. From then on, Peter swore to use his powers for good as the superhero Spider-Man. But it's not always so easy. Years later, when Gwen Stacy was thrown off of a bridge by the Green Goblin, Peter tried to catch her with his webbing, only to accidentally snap her neck and kill her in the process. Now, whether or not that happened has been called into question over the years, but the snap sound effect in the original comic seemed pretty clear-cut to me. Does that make Spider-Man a horrible person? Of course not. He had no way of knowing that would happen, and no other way to save her. But again, he was responsible for what happened to Uncle Ben. And perhaps it's this responsibility that saved Peter's soul. The black and white tragedy of Bruce's parents made it so much easier for him to become an avenging angel of darkness. But Peter can forgive the world because he's had to forgive himself. So that's my list of top 10 comic book deaths. Again, I hope you'll share your list in the comments section, as well as check out issue number four of my new comic book, Superbia. You can pick it up at your local comic book store or download it online. The links to do so are in the video description. I'm Grace Randall for Think About the Ink, and I hope to see you back on Friday for Between the Pages. Until then, happy reading.